Exodus chapter 25, we're going to again uh, approach this in a summary form. So 25, 26, 27, and 28 is a territory we want to cover. We're talking about the place of meeting, the construction of it, uh, the clothes of the priest, the furniture that's going to be in this tabernacle of meeting. And it's, uh, it's pretty amazing to think about it. Uh, you know, later this tabernacle of meeting is going to be called the temple. It will become a permanent dwelling place. Um, but the Tabernacle of Meeting, I love that name because it's, it's a place to meet with the Lord. And um, we are that place today, collectively, um, living stones being brought together. Um, I encourage you as we go through um, Exodus, especially these portions, uh, these chapters of the book of Exodus, is you might want to pick up and read Hebrews right now because there's so much that we're covering um, and he, you know, as a background to the book of Hebrews, so you might want to just pick that up and read it. It'll take you a couple of, you know, an hour and a half, something like that, maybe at the most, to read that. So you can read it in a few days, a little bit at a time, and hopefully just to see how um, Jesus is that fulfillment. Um, in Colossians, it talks about how Jesus is the um, is the substance, but all of these things were the shadow, and you're going to see that so clearly in some of the most amazing. Um, details. So let's pick up. I'm not going to read all of the verses, but we are going to sample it as we go through. We begin at chapter 25, verses 1 through 7, with the construction project that Moses is going to announce. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood, oil for the light, and spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. So they got all of these material blessings when they left Egypt. Remember when they left, they asked their neighbors, hey, can we have some of your stuff? And they just loaded them down with all kinds of goods and silver and gold and said, yes, please just get out of here as fast as you can. Take what you want. Well, all of these become the things that they're able to actually give back to uh, the construction project that they might have a place to do this. And so they are making an offering. This isn't the first construction project in the Bible. The first one was Noah's Ark. And there is a similarity. I'll let you just kind of work it out between Noah's Ark and this temple. Both of them are, are dealing with sin, but uh, one is a better solution than the other. Um, and then, of course, the final salvation uh, plan comes through Jesus Christ, which we're going to talk a lot about today. So the lot, the, as we think about giving, um, we read that how they gave. Um, but what about giving for us in the New Testament? Because I've made a big deal over this point, because I believe it's biblical, is that the Mosaic Law is an indivisible unit, meaning you cannot just take portions of the Mosaic Law and say, we like this part, this part, this part. Not that part. We'll take this part and then say, here we go. No, you, you, if you've got to continue in all things written in the book of the law, if you sin at one point, you break the whole thing. But what about tithing? This is what they're giving here. It's not necessarily a tithe. It's a free will offering. It doesn't say a certain percentage. It just says bring it. So, but what, what is the response in the New Testament? Are we required to give? And what I would say is um, no and yes. Um, there is not a, a 10% tithe that we would take from the Mosaic Covenant and then say you must do this because it it's in the Old Testament. We wouldn't do that. But yes, we are to give because it instructs us to do that in the New Testament. And so there's a few places um, where you can find that. And first, let me just say this. Why should we give to the Lord? Is he broke? I mean, I mean, what, why does he need my money anyway? Well, it's not that he needs it. He allows us. He allows us to participate in this. And so he blesses us. We're able to take a portion of what we have and give it back to him. And, um, and now we get to use that for a purpose that is eternal. So it is a privilege to be able to do it. So we ought to give out of reverence. We ought to give as a matter of worship. Um, and we ought to do that in a practical 
respect to support the ministry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm not going to turn there, but you can read it on your own. There's a lot of teaching about giving. And there, Paul was telling the Corinthians to make certain that they, taught, they took that gift that they promised to give to those that were experiencing a famine back in Jerusalem. They were going to send a gift to them. It was a gift of benevolence for the poor. And he says, hey, when I come, make sure you have it ready. And he goes, but give it joyfully, give it generously, and, and make certain that it's, you, you're doing this from your heart. It's not something of um, grudging obligation. Nobody ever wants to receive a gift out of grudging obligation, do you? You're like, well, it depends on what it is. Maybe I do. I don't know. Okay. But most of the time, you don't want to receive that gift. You know, if somebody, if somebody, if you gave a gift to somebody around Christmas time, and a week later they came back and said, hey, I got a gift for you as well. I mean, I wasn't planning on getting you one, but you gave me one, so I figured I better get you one. I really don't have the money to get you this gift. But I felt obligated after your kindness to give you a gift. So here's your gift. Please enjoy. Oh, by the way, my kids doesn't, don't get shoes this Christmas. I mean, how do you feel? Are you glad to receive that gift from them? Or be like, uh, you know what? Can you please just take that back? Because, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to receive. This feels really awkward and strange. Well, I, the Lord doesn't want grudging obligation. He wants it to be joyful. He wants us to be generous with it. This is a, the teaching of the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't teach a tithe. It teaches generosity. And then says, you determine in your own heart what that is. You go figure that out in prayer. Um, so what do we support? Well, okay, 2 Corinthians 9, we can give to those that are in need. Um, 3 John, verses 5 and 8 read, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. Who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers of the truth. So there are people that are traveling around doing mission work. And these believers helped them out. He says, you did a great job. You talked about how you support Many other churches supported the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Philippians helped out. The Thessalonians, uh, uh, Thessalonica, the church at Thessalonica, they gave. So you can give in the support of the mission work. And then in 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18, the third way that I see you can give in the New Testament is to support the local church work. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So the local church and the labor there should be supported. The mission work should be supported. And those that are in need. And you're going to have to seek the face of the Lord and find out what it is you should give. It's like, well, they gave a tenth in the Old Testament. Well, actually, sometimes they gave a tenth. Right now, we don't know how much they were giving. But this is actually, if you count it up, and I'm not going to take the time to go do this, but I think I, I taught this in Malachi. Um, they actually gave 23 and a third percent every year, not, not 10 percent. 10 percent was for the temple. 10 percent was the increase of their land. And then 10 percent was given every third year for the poor. 23 and a third percent is what they gave. And so, um, you know, this is, this is why I, I kind of like, I think it's funny when, uh, people are really trying to, you know, put the screws to the congregation and say, you've got to tithe, you've got to tithe, you've got to tithe, you've got to tithe. And they go to First or Second Corinthians 9 and they begin to talk about that. And I think, well, first of all, you're grabbing a, a principle from the Old Testament and you're trying to impose it upon them. But the one that actually that you're trying to impose upon them would only require them to give three and a third percent that year. That's just kind of a little pastor funny thing, I guess. But um. You know, it's like, that's the wrong passage. You know, you're, you're mixing things together. And, you know, on one hand, you're saying, you know, be generous, but you're using the Old Testament, and that only required a little bit. So um, the point is, you go get alone with Jesus, and you determine how much that you should give. Why is it that we have a hard time giving? Well, sometimes we don't have enough, it would seem. But this is where faith comes in, right? That God is going to provide. Um, sometimes it's just we're not willing to let go of something that is valuable to us. It's not that you don't have it to give. It's that you don't want to 
put it in somebody else's hands. You don't want to uh, have uh, that thing given away. You worked far, hard for it. You have other priorities. There can be all kinds of reasons. But does the New Testament teach that we, the church, should be giving? Absolutely. To the needy, to the support of the local work, to missions. So as you give here, I, one thing I will say is that we do help out with benevolence. We help people out when they, when they come. And there's a team that looks at that and reviews all that. And we give to that. There's, um, we give, on average, about 15 to 20% of whatever comes in, except for designated mission funds. That doesn't count. On top of that, just the general ties, we give about you know, 15 to 20%. Um, so you know, we're doing this. We pay the staff. We take care of the building. These are the types of things that, that we do. We try to save so we can be ready for projects like we're having right now with construction and stuff. So this is, this is what's going on with the finances, and you're welcome to ask about it any time if you give here. So this is, this is something that you can take and you can ponder um, and let the Lord work in your heart. I mean, at different times in our, all of our lives, we've had to work through different aspects of this. Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's harder. Sometimes it, you know, it just depends on what's happening in your own life. Well, in verse 6, they also are told to um, bring um, some incense. And this incense is going to be used at the altar of incense. It's going to be used in many different ways. But, you know, when you would walk into the tabernacle that we're going to read of, you wouldn't smell anything that was secular. There was a special compound and anointing oil that they would have. Um, they were to place it in the fire. They anoint the priest with it. There's, so when you went into the tabernacle, it had a distinct smell and aroma, not smell, aroma that you would um, only find there. It wasn't secular. I think it's a kind of an interesting picture that inside the church of Jesus Christ, it shouldn't be secular. It should be set apart. It should be holy. Well, let's move on. Verse 8 says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And today we are the temple of God. Uh, of God. Um, each of us are living stones. And together we are brought together and we are put together as a house of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And the Lord is in our midst. He walks in the midst of his church. Yes, you individually are are a dwelling place of God, and the Spirit of the Lord dwells within you. But us collectively, we meet with the Lord. So you can meet with the Lord all by yourself wherever you are, and I hope that you are. But also when we come together, there's the, the collective meeting with the Lord. So I wouldn't trade any of them away. I want both of them. Both of these are God's idea that we would experience Him individually, but also together. 2 Corinthians 6, uh, 14 uh, down into chapter 7, verse 1, makes this really clear. Paul says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? So here it is. You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So because of this deep, intimate connection we have with God... There's an exhortation that we would part with sin, knowing that when we come together as a body of Christ, that God is in our midst. And the last thing we'd want to do is to bring something in that he would find offensive. I mean, you know, you, would you, the answer is yes. Would you be offended if you came in and somebody had a little idol sitting in the chair next to them? Yeah, you'd be totally offended and, and, and properly so. You're like, what are you doing with this thing? This doesn't belong here. This doesn't belong anywhere except in the trash can. What are you doing with this? And, and so the exhortation is, well, then make sure you're purifying your heart. Make sure you're cleansing your heart so you're not mixing these things together. But it was the tabernacle of meeting that we're going to meet with the Lord there as we meet with the Lord when we come together as the church. In chapter 25, verses 9 through 22, they are instructed 
to, uh, to make the Ark of the Covenant. And just a couple of verses. Verse 9 says, According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all of its furnishings, just so you shall make it. So build it like I tell you. And he's going to tell them the dimensions. He's going to tell them to make it of acacia wood. He's going to tell them to overlay it with gold. He's going to tell them to put rings on the side of it and to run poles through that. So remember, they're traveling around the wilderness. They have to be able to carry these things. Um, and overlay it all with gold. He's going to tell them to put a lid on it, which is called the mercy seat. Um, in the, on this lid, there's going to be angels that have wings that are spread out going forward, as you see in that, that image up on the screen in front of you. And so this is the Ark of the Covenant. In verse 22, he says, And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in the commandment to the children of Israel. Now, we use this term mercy seat, and I would imagine some, if you've never studied this before, you're thinking of like, well, I guess this is like a throne room where you come in and there's a chair and God is sitting there. And from that chair, he shows mercy. Well, he does show mercy from his throne room. But the, this term for mercy seat, it's not a chair, it's, it's, it's a lid. It's, it's what's seated on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, there's going to be the table of the law. There's going to be Aaron's rod that buds. And there's going to be a, a, a jar of manna. And these three things would be inside the box. And then you'd have the lid that was placed over it. And this Ark of the Covenant, and you'll see it later, is going to be put into the <clears throat> most holy place, that room that only a, one high priest could go one time out of the year on the Day of Atonement with blood to atone for the sins of Israel. And it's on this lid, it's on this mercy seat that is covering the, the law that they broke and that we break, and the blood would be sprinkled and they would find this atonement for themselves but here's something that's super super cool the old testament was written in hebrew later on in history it was translated into greek does anybody know what that translation is called the septuagint so the greek um, translation the old testament septuagint uh, when you look at these words for mercy seat it's um helisterion helisterion and if you go into the New Testament and you look for that word that's translated mercy seat, you find it. And you can find it in, in one place in particular, and that's in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. And the word that is translated is not mercy seat, but it's propitiation. Propitiation. It's the same exact Greek word when you compare it. Um, so... Let's read verse 25. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Whom God set forth as a propitiation, or as a what? A mercy seat. By his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Another form of this Greek word is used in John, and it talks about how Jesus has come to be a propitiation for our sins. So in the Old Testament, you have this Ark of the Covenant, you have the lid. The lid is covering the commandments. The commandments have been broken. The blood must be sprinkled on top of this to atone for their sins. But Jesus, he is our propitiation. But he's not just the propitiation. He's not just the mercy seat. He's also the blood sacrifice that's going to be sprinkled. So as you go through this tabernacle, you can find Jesus all through it. Remember, Colossians says that these things were a shadow, but Christ is the substance. Now, I do think some, some, sometimes, you know, we can go overboard and begin to say, every, you know, okay, this you know, thread means this color and this. And there's no way to really establish it. This, you know, skin means this and that skin means that. I do believe it means something. I just think we have a hard time figuring out some of this. Is as evidenced by the fact that you pick up three different commentaries and all of them are going to tell you that something is different. But the ones I want to focus on here today, these are ones that are, are easily established in the New Testament for what they are. So this, this lid, the mercy seat, 
Well, Jesus is the propitiation. He is our propitiation. And um, that is that covering of our sins. He is um, the one who removes our sins. So what a beautiful picture. If we move into the next uh, piece of furniture inside the tabernacle, the same thing. Uh, We come to the table of showbread. Again, he tells them they are to make it of wood. He tells them the length of it there in uh, verse 23. Verse 24, he says, overlay it, overlay it with gold. Um, put rings on it. Um, put four legs on it. Um, and the, the, you can carry this easily. You, may, you shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold. And you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. So the showbread is it's 12 pieces of bread. Why 12? How many tribes of Israel are there? 12. There's going to be 12 stones on his breastplate. He's going to have two onyx stones that are part of that. Uh, you know, you have the onyx stones, you got a chain, you got the breastplate. And on those onyx stones, there's going to be six names on either side. And three different ways, at least three different ways, the, the priest would go in representing the nation of Israel before the Lord. And Jesus is the one that is our mediator. He is our faithful high priest that goes in. But you have the table of showbread. So you have this table, they would place the bread, and it was always to be fresh. This wasn't something that they were to allow to get dry and moldy and because it was representing something. What was it representing? Well, Jesus, in his I am statements, he said a few things. But one thing that he said, he said, I am the what? Bread of life. We're going to take communion, and Jesus said, take and eat this bread. This is my body, which is broken for you. So to have, you know, moldy, stale bread isn't right. But not only is it called the table of showbread, but there's another name that is used for it. It's called the the table of what? Or the bread of presence is what it said, the bread of presence. So this bread represented the presence of God. Sit down, eat, commune. Have, have the bread, eat of it. And so for us, it, the idea that there would be moldy, crusty, dry bread, it just isn't fitting because it's, it's the bread of pre- presence. You would come into the presence of the Lord and there was that bread. And I don't know what your life looks like right now in your walk with the Lord. Is it fresh? Is it fresh bread? You've met with the Lord here recently? There's, there's, there's something desirable about it. Because if you have not met with the Lord in a while, then there probably is not fresh. There probably is something that needs to be refreshed. In Acts 3.19, it tells us this. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from what? The presence of the Lord. This is the bread of presence. And the Lord is the one who refreshes us. And as we eat of this bread, as we meet with the Lord and commune with him, there will be a freshness. And you know this. We all know this. You you know when you're starting to get cranky and and miserable and irritable. You know, why is that? Because it's a bad day? No, that's not why. It's because you're not communing with the Lord. And there's not a freshness of the presence of God in your life. Because you know when you're communing with the Lord and the trial comes, you're like, oh, yes, I'm ready for it. Praise the Lord. I'm ready for this trial. Lord, I'm not going to stress out over this one. I'm going to wait and see what you do. And there's that fresh, you know, kind of life that you have to, to encounter that. So you have the table of showbread or the bread of presence. And then in chapter 25, verses 31 through 40, you have the golden lampstand. Jesus also said, I am not only the bread of life, I am what? I'm the light of the world. And so this lampstand was made of pure gold. Um, There was going to be uh, seven uh, places, you know, candles on this one menorah. And it was to have oil. It was never to burn out. This was never to, uh, to go out. Because once you got inside this tabernacle, there was no windows. And you had... You know, a couple of layers of um, uh, curtains over it. So you didn't have hardly any light coming in. If that candle or that lampstand was not lit, you didn't see what was going on in there. Which is, I think, a pretty fitting picture for trying to walk through this life without 
the light of Jesus Christ. You have no idea. You're just you're, you're bumping into things. You're bumbling around. And it doesn't feel right. You need to come to the light of the Lord. You, let, you need to let Him shine light into your life on how to live. You need to allow Him to, to, to bring blessing and comfort to your life. And so Jesus is the light of the world. And they were to have this. John, 8, uh, John chapter 8, verse 12 is where you find Jesus saying, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So this image that you're seeing here, it is, um, it's the holy place. So you have in this first section, kind of at the bottom of the picture, um, where you see those two angels, um, this is how you would come into that. And only the priest could go in there. Once you got in there, Hopefully you can make out there's a lampstand, there's an altar of incense, there's a table of showbread that would be kind of behind the curtain to the right. And then you have that second curtain, again with the cutaway, and behind that second curtain is the Holy of Holies. And that is where the Ark of the Covenant is, where the priest would go once a year. And that's where the mercy seat was, and that's where they would sprinkle that, uh, the blood on it. And this is where the Shekinah glory of God rested was back there. But in that first chamber, the priests would be attending to it daily, but only the priests. And so on the outside of it, um, there's two art, um, items there that we're going to talk about in just a moment. There's a, the laver, which is where they would have water to wash. And then there was a bronze altar where they would offer their sacrifices. Um, in chapter 26 and 27, you get the plans for the tabernacle itself. So we read about some of the furniture but as you move into 26 and 27, you get the plans for the tabernacle. And um, what you see in verse 1 is on the inside, there's going to be 10 curtains of fine woven linen, blue, purple, scarlet thread with artistic designs of cherubim. You shall weave them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits in the width. So you get all the details of this. And so you can see that kind of represented in that, that image. Then when you move on down... Uh, to verse 7, it says, You shall also make curtains of goat's hair to be a tent over the tabernacle. So you have the tabernacle with all these beautiful, um, you know, bright colored uh, curtains. But then you had this black goat's hair that was over the top of it. And so from the outside, it didn't look like much. But once you got on the inside, it was something that was beautiful. So there was 11 of those. And they would put this together. Um, you, there was loops that were made. Um, for the curtains to be hung on. Um, there are bronze clasps, there was gold clasps, there was silver. There's all different types um, of materials that were used. In verses 15 through 30, you get the framework. How was this thing going to actually go up? How was it going to be held together? And so you find that there is the, kind of the construction plans for this. It was it meant to be portable. You had to take it down and put it up. And so it was the uh, Lord's plan to make it easy for them. Uh, in verse 31, chapter 26, verse 31, we read down to verse 34. You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine woven li linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon the four sockets of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the Ark of the Testimony, or the Ark of the Covenant, in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider between, excuse me, divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. So you had the holy place where they were daily, then the most holy, which was where the Ark of the Covenant was. You shall put the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy. So that second veil is the one that we just read about. And that is where only one man would go once a year. And so this was to be a barrier. But that barrier was ripped from top to bottom. Does anybody know when that was ripped? When Jesus was hanging on the cross. When our mercy seat was shedding his blood and sin was being atoned for. This is just this is amazing. The imagery that's painted for us. And so he's hanging on the cross. His body, that is the veil is being ripped apart. He was scourged. He had a spear in the side, nails in his hands and in his feet, a crown of thorns. His beard had been ripped out. He had been punched while being blindfolded. His body was shredded. 
And as he hung upon the cross, God, the Father, ripped that veil from top to bottom, saying, anybody can come in now. Anybody can come in. And everybody should come in through my son, through his body. Let's read Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, that is the most holiest, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is that flesh. So, see, you can say, is that, what is that veil? That veil is his flesh. Because Scripture tells you that it is. You know that the mercy seat, that that is the Lord, because he is our propitiation. So there's a lot of things in Scripture you can really nail down as what they are. I am the light of the world, lampstand. I am the bread of the life, bread of presence. So you can see these things, but now we have freedom to come into the presence of the Lord. I know we've made reference to this a couple of times, but hopefully now you can see the powerful imagery. Can you imagine the priests when they came in? That next morning, into that uh, to the holy place, where they were doing taking care of the bread and the oil, and they saw this thing ripped from top to bottom. Who did this? Well, I mean, nobody did it except for the Lord, and He was saying, "People can come now. There's no more limitations. The door is wide open to come and fellowship with Me." And that is God's invitation to you: just come and fellowship with Him, in the tabernacle of meeting. And I pray that we all are taking appropriate advantage of that. And then uh, in verses uh, 35 through 37, you have a description of the outer veil that was going to be placed in um, um, there at the holy place. And chapter 27, verses 1 through 8, you have the bronze altar. Bronze altar was just outside of the holy place. It is a, where they would bring all their sacrifices. So if you look at this, um, that altar would be um, uh, the first one. So you come in through that first entrance. You can see the colorful entryway um, at the bottom of the screen. As you come in, the first thing you would see is the altar of sacrifice. Sin had to be dealt with. And so um, it was a bronze altar that was made. All the offerings were placed there. And then you just had um, the court of the tabernacle. That's that open area. Um, when the temple's made, you had the court of the Gentiles, you had the court of the women. But at this point, it is, um, it's limited. So the three main sections were the outer court, the inner court, where the priests would go, and then the holy of holies. The size of the uh, holy place was 45 feet long. So those two rooms, 45 feet long, 15 wide, and 15 high. The whole uh, compound was 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, and seven and a half feet. Um, 75 feet wide, seven, seven and a half feet high. And check this out. Estimated there was 3,140 pounds of gold, 9,575 pounds of silver, 7,540 pounds of bronze, plus all the fabrics and all the cloths and animal skins and stones that were brought. They gave generously. It's estimated that it took them about six months to construct this tabernacle. Moving on, verses 20 and 21, it says, And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. So inside there, they have this lamp, but it's never to go out. In the tabernacle of meeting, outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. There should always be a supply of oil. The light was never to go out. And just as the oil should never burn out in the tabernacle of meeting, so we should have a fresh supply of the enabling work of the Holy Spirit in our life at all times. This is what Paul said to the Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 8. Be being continually filled with the Spirit. And so the, the, the oil representing um, many places, the, the, pre, the, the power of the Spirit, we're told in um, uh, James that when we're going to pray for somebody that we should anoint them with oil and so it's this idea of the presence of the Lord the the spirit of the Lord and so they weren't to be out of oil they were to have that continual flow and it is the spirit that continually gives us the strength to live the way we are supposed to be living 
Well, into our last chapter, we get to the, 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 the priest's clothing. And so hopefully you got the image. Last service, I didn't give it to them. I thought I did. But you are the lucky ones. You get to see this. So um, this is kind of a, a, an idea. And you can just leave it up here as I move through this entire section. Um, this is an artist's rendition of possibly how um, the high priest would have dressed. I mean, this is, he's dressed up, right? And it's for glory and honor. Um, on the, starting at the top, you had his turban. Um, you move down onto his shoulders. You have the black onyx stones with the six names on each one of the tribes. So you ended up with 12. You have the breastplate with the different color stones, each one representing a tribe. You have the sash around his waist. Um, the colorful um, ephod is um, what is underneath the sash and underneath that breastplate. Um, you had the, the tunic that goes down to his ankles. Um, you had a robe, and he's carrying a censer. So, I mean, there's a lot to this that the Lord wanted them to be wearing. And this is how Aaron and his uh, sons were to, to appear before the Lord. Let me just read a couple of verses. Let's pick up at um, verse t- 9 of this section, chapter 28. Then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six names on the other stone, in order of their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold. You shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. You shall also make settings of gold, and you shall make two chains of pure gold like braided cords and fasten the braided chains to the setting. So uh, you have this. In verses, you have, as you keep on reading, you have um, the breastplate in verses 15 through 39 with the stones. And again, the idea is, while all of this worship is going on, you have the people of Israel being represented before the Lord. He is a mediator. He's a go-between. That's what a priest is, a go-between. And, you know, we are called in, um, by Peter that we are the priesthood today. We are the holy priesthood. So are we going to atone for sins? No, we don't atone for sins. But we are able to bear the light of Christ to people and to tell them to be reconciled to the Lord And so we should always be thinking about that job of taking the gospel out to the people. In verse 30, there is a reference to the uh, stones, the Urim and the Thummim. Um, And these, uh, don't know exactly what they were, but the, the, the words mean light and perfections. It is thought that maybe they were used to discern the will of God. Uh, Black and white stone was drawn out of a pouch. Black meant no, yes meant white. Don't know for certain. Maybe this is what Peter had in mind in Acts chapter 2, um, 1, Acts chapter 1, when they were trying to replace Judas with Matthias and they drew lots. Maybe that's what was going on. But today we have the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and we know the voice of our shepherd. In verses 31 through 35, we see that they are to put um, uh, little pomegranate bells on the uh, border of the priest's clothing. So he kind of jingled as he went about his business. Cool thing is, a couple of years ago, they found one of these gold pomegranate bells um, in some of the archaeological digs around the Temple Mount. So um, those of you that are going, um, and and I'm almost positive, I'm not 100%, but I think they found this in the Temple Mount Sifting Project. And we're going to be, when we go, we, we did this last time, we're going to do it again. They just give you a bunch of uh, debris and you sift through it and you look for things. And you always find stuff. And I think this is maybe where they found one of those little pomegranate bells. I, I could be wrong on that, but they found it recently and um, they found a lot of interesting things. But it's just kind of like, oh, okay, there's a little pomegranate bell. And they found one that would have been on the priest's clothing. Um, Verses 39 through 43, strict dress code. Let's just, let's just read these last verses and we'll wrap it up. You shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread. You shall make the turban of fine linen. And you shall make the sash of woven work. 
For Aaron's sons you shall make tunics, and you shall make sashes for them, and you shall make hats for them, for glory and beauty. So this is why they look the way they do. So you shall put them on Aaron, and your brother, and on his sons with him. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them that they, minister, that they minister to me as priests. And you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs. They shall be on Aaron and on his sons. When they come into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, that they do not incur iniquity and die, it shall be a statute forever to him and his descendants." So this was not just simply an afterthought. Why such harsh consequences for not wearing what God had told them to wear? Well, I think when we look in Scripture, we see that um, the Lord is the one who is actually tells us to put off the filthy rags and to put on the new clothes, right? And in Isaiah 61, verse 10, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, for my soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Well, we are the bride of Christ. And we have been decked out by the Lord in the garments of salvation. And we can't come into the presence of the Lord without salvation. You, can't, you, you can know about it. You can think about it. Your parents can know about it. Your grandparents can know about it. Your kids can know about it. But you must receive these garments. You need to be dressed and be made ready to come into the presence of the Lord. Not physical clothes, but your heart. It needs to be made right. It needs to be made clean. And so we can come into the presence of the Lord because the Lord has provided the clothing that we need. Salvation, the forgiveness of sins. To wrap it up, we can meet with the Lord. That's the first and great point for us to know. We can meet with the Lord. And we should be those that are supporting the work of the Lord and seek the face of God on that. We should be thankful that Jesus has made a way. He's a bread of life. He's a light of the world. He is that veil that was torn. He is our propitiation. He is our faithful high priest who has provided atonement for us. And the exhortation is to draw near with a full heart of assurance, to come and to meet with the Lord. Right now we're going to share in communion. And this is for all those who put their faith and trust in the Lord. So as this comes around, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then we want you to take this and we want you to eat. But just as there's all these symbols and these uh, uh, items that are representing something else, it's going to happen again today. We have the communion service. And as it comes around, there's going to be uh, two cups stacked together. You're going to have the bread and you're going to have the cup. That's the fruit of the vine. The bread is the body of Jesus. He said that we should take and eat this as his body broken for us. And the cup represents his blood. And the Lord, these are the most significant symbols you can find. And on planet Earth, no, no more powerful symbols. And as you eat that bread, be reminded of the body of the Lord. As you drink that cup, notice that it's sweet. Notice that it's bitter. Because when Jesus went to the cross, it was a bitter thing. But, oh, salvation is sweet for us to be made clean.